Hyper Wellbeing, a podcast about the startups, technologies, and people driving a brand new healthcare industry. Healthcare for healthy people. Consumer and data driven, emerging as devices, apps, mobile, biology, health, and wellness converge. Continuous prediction, prevention, and optimization paradigm. And now, over to your host, D.S. Dreibra. On today's show, we have Ben Wang, who is the chairman and chief executive officer of Profuso. From his early exposure as an undergraduate research fellow at the lab of Leroy Hood at Caltech, where the automated DNA sequencer was developed to bring in cutting-edge life science tools to the market at Life Technologies Corp, acquired by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Ben has seen firsthand the transformative impact that science and technology have to change our world. Prior to Profusor, Ben served in a variety of leadership roles at Life Technologies Corp, including President of the Asia-Pacific Region and Head of the QPCR Division. A former management consultant at McKinsey & Company, Ben earned his MA and PhD in Biology from the Johns Hopkins University. Hi, hey Ben. Welcome to the eighth episode of the Hyper Wellbeing Podcast. Hey, thanks a million, Lee, for having me. I appreciate it. Excellent. I've been very interested in Profusa for a number of years. Could you be so kind as to give an introduction to your company, Profusa? Well, sure. Um, we are a company based in uh, South San Francisco, California, and over the past uh, eight years or so have developed uh, what we consider to be a quite exciting platform. Uh, the gist of it is our technology platform allows for the real-time uh, unleashing, if you will, or measurement of an individual's personal biochemistry in real time, continuous, uh, anywhere, and uh, done so in a way that is very non-intrusive to an individual's life uh, at a cost where it's incredibly accessible. And, and what is important about our platform uh, besides sort of the the low cost and un unobtrusive nature of of using the technology, uh, is that what we measure in real time also are things that physicians care about. These are uh, values of your biochemistry, such as your glucose level, your calcium, sodium, potassium, uh, blood gases uh, that that physicians are relying upon and using today to make therapeutic choices. And so our aspiration is to be able to make those values available in real time for anybody, uh, anywhere. Appreciated. I understand that Profusor are unique because they're doing in-body sensors, injectable sensors. And these are about, well, I would say smaller than a, a grain of rice. They're five millimeter by half a millimeter. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, what's what's um, unique, uh, one of the unique features of our technology is that the sensors, or what allows us to actually measure the body, uh, biochemistry, uh, is actually inside the body, but, but it's inside the body in a way where it does not elicit what's called a foreign body response. So what we place inside the body is very, very small. Uh, as you said, Lee, they're about three to five millimeters in length, and the diameter is a, a couple of hundred microns. So put that in perspective. It's the width of a few hairs, and the placement of this little sensor inside this, under the skin is done so by a typical injection that's no more invasive than if you were to go to your physician to uh, get a vaccine or get a vial of blood drawn. And once that little sliver of sensor or sliver of hydrogel that's placed under the skin, that, that sensor is very passive. It actually has no active electronic components. It doesn't actively ping out a signal. There's no battery uh, on it. It's literally a material that's very similar to the material that, that composes a soft contact lenses. And we've embedded on that material fluorescence sensing chemistry that senses biochemistry uh, in a very accurate way. And the big, huge innovation is our approach uh, enables that sensor, that little element under the skin, to evade what is called a foreign body response. And that foreign body response is something all of us uh, should all be quite familiar with. Our bodies are... Uh, 
through evolution are exquisitely good, exquisitely good, almost perfect, in fact, at determining what belongs inside our body and what doesn't belong inside our body. So for the past close to half a century, the industry has been trying very, very hard to try to solve this problem. And how do I put sensors inside the body without the body recognize it as being foreign? Because when the body recognizes an element as being foreign, what happens is the, the immunological response kicks in, your immune cells tries to get rid of that foreign body, that foreign object. And when the immune cell is not able to do so, because obviously any sensor you put inside the body or any element you put inside the body that is hard, your immune cells are not able to chew it up and get rid of it. The body then tries to minimize the potential damage of that foreign element by putting collagen or, and, or scar tissue around that to wrap that foreign element up in a way where, the, where, where that foreign element cannot harm the body. And that's exactly what happens to most traditional sensors, whether it's a needle sensor through the skin, like current uh, continuous glucose monitors out on the market, or some of the implanted sensors that people have tried in the past, is the body recognizes as foreign, start encapsulating that sensor with collagen and scar tissue. Now, pretty soon, whether even if the sensor still works, the sensor is now measuring the chemistry of the scar tissue rather than the chemistry of the body. And the chemistry of the scar tissue, unfortunately, bears little resemblance of actually what's happening for the, in the rest of the physiology. And that, that's created a big, big problem for uh, people who are trying to develop biochemical sensors in the past, where the solution is to either code it with drugs to decrease the amount of encapsulation, or you just have to pull it out and change it uh, every two days, seven days, maybe a week or so, a couple of weeks or so. Our approach and what we've been able to solve is that foreign body response problem. So that little sliver of hydrogel that we put under the skin, Lee, as you said, it is quite small. And it's also artic are architected in a way that the body doesn't mind it being there. In other words, the body doesn't see it as foreign. And if the body doesn't see that element as foreign, then that element could stay within under the skin and in place for uh, ever. And it w really doesn't cause any problems for the function of the sensor. So our sensors actually can function for months and years at a time relative to uh, just a few weeks as the best-in-class sensors are out there in the market today. And that really drives a big, big difference in how a user might use it and, the, and how an individual might actually adopt it into their lives because it really doesn't pose any additional burden other than a person living their lives as, living their life as the way they, they uh, normally would. I believe it's 60% porous and it's implanted eight millimeters below the skin surface. So it's measuring interstitial fluid. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's correct. So it's about 60 to 70% porous. And so there are a couple of features of the sensor that we've engineered so that it, um, it can overcome that foreign body response because that is the foreign body response really is the key barrier for long-term continuous sensing as it's been attempted, you know, for the last uh, half a century, as I mentioned before. And one of the key features of the sensor for it to be, for our sensor for it to be able to overcome this foreign body response is um, this uh, microarchitecture of porosity. And these interconnected pores within the, the small uh, hydrogel, these interconnected pores within the body uh, um, encourages the body to grow healthy tissue throughout the interior of the sensor. It basically mimics what is called an extracellular matrix. It mimics the scaffolding that the body naturally would produce uh, to allow cells to grow on that scaffolding, which creates, uh, which makes the heart, the, uh, the shape of the heart, uh, what it is, which makes a kidney, the shape of a kidney or the liver, the shape of a liver. That's actually done through this uh, scaffold called the extracellular matrix. And our sensor basically mimics that extracellular matrix. So the body doesn't see it as foreign. And it, it, it drives healthy tissue uh, uh, throughout the interior of that, of that uh, hydrogel. And we place that sensor uh, within, uh, you know, two to eight, 10 millimeters under the skin uh, uh, 
be, because we want to have the sensor close enough to the surface of the skin so that the light signal could come through the skin easily and we could actually detect it. And what works great also is, and therefore in that two to eight, two to, eight, two to 10 millimeter uh, under the skin distance in that compartment of the body, if you will, that is the space that's called, as you mentioned, the, the um, interstitial uh, space. And the interstitial fluid that we actually measure uh, is the fluid that bathes the cells. It's the environment, the local environment that your cells actually experience. And it's important that we measure the activity or the biochemistry within that area, within the interstitial sp uh, fluid, because um, it's what the cells experience. And so any increase or decline in uh, any particular biochemistry or biomarker that the cell will experience uh, would have a lot more clinical relevance um, for your health and for your activity. And it being an in interstitial fluid, so you can potentially measure electrolytes, glucose, oxygen, lactate, pH, ethanol, any others that come to my, to come to your mind there. I mean, potentially. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, really, um, we have a pretty robust pipeline in the company. We are, we're relatively early stages, and so we have oxygen, uh, interstitial fluid, uh, dissolved oxygen that's approved in Europe. We have glucose uh, in our pipeline that's in um, clinical studies now. Uh, we have a lactate program that actually is about to get into the clinical study, and uh, we've demonstrated on the bench top a variety of other analytes uh, you mentioned a few, ethanol, pH, calcium, potassium, sodium, uh, and, and a variety of others. And, and the key to what we could actually measure really is twofold, or uh, quite frankly, three. One is, uh, obviously, because we are in the interstitial fluid, that whatever it is that we're measuring need to be available uh, in the interstitial fluid. So, for example, we probably... Uh, are not going to be able to measure, you know, to be able to do um, red blood cell count, which is one of the things that a blood draw would normally uh, could do. Uh, we won't be able to, to count number of red blood cells because that that information is not attainable in the interstitial fluid. But as long as the biochemical, the marker that we're looking at is available in the interstitial fluid, uh, we have a shot at getting it. And two, it needs to be in the high enough abundance. Uh, so that the lock and key model, the sensing chemistry, uh, can sense it. And then three, obviously, is that the sensing chemistry itself uh, can be produced. And fortunately for us, um, those requirements actually are um, really amenable to the to a technological solution uh, for measurement because. Um, as I mentioned, most important biochemistries are available in interstitial fluid because th uh, those are all things that need to be available to the cells for the cells uh, function and activity and survival. And so interstitial fluid act, uh, is actually a great space to make those measurements. Um, the fact is that most of those elements are ab available in abundance for the cells to actually have access to or uh, for the cells to actually get rid of. And then the third is because these biochemistries are important, um, the ability to detect it in, in traditional clinical chemistry fashions, those lock and key and those detection chemicals uh, have been developed for the most part. And so we could just go ahead and, and pick off of those menu and do our uh, uh, modification to them uh, to tailor to our system so it'll work. So, um, you know, the, the potential application actually is incredibly broad. Uh, and, and we're quite excited about that. Future. So this seems a, a breakthrough you have. And if I compare it to, say, say Abbott's uh, Freestyle Libre or, um, say, Dexcom's G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor, these are patches which have a pin on them, an electrode actually, that breaks through the skin, it, uh, it directly into the interstitial fluid. And then these will suffer from the foreign body response hence why they have a, a very limited time within the body. But what you're doing is splitting the electrode a, a piece apart. It goes into the body, and you, you use an external reader, and that electrode, as you had said earlier, it doesn't elicit the foreign body response. But you do need a, a specific reader to supply to read optics of that electrode. Could, could you explain a little bit about 
the uh, the three stages of the sensor, you know, the optical excitation, the fluorescence emission, and then the photo detection and, and data processing. Could you just give some kind of a simple idea as far as possible of those three stages, please? Ben? Sure. No, surely uh, I'm happy to. So first of all, let me take a step back here and just say, um, you know, you mentioned a couple of giants in the industry, right, uh, uh, with Abbott and Medtronic um, and Dexcom. And we, we, we feel incredibly lucky and fortunate to be in a space where there are just a bunch of really great science and wonderful dedicated scientists to try to solve some fundamental problems in, 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 in chronic disease management. And so being in an industry and in a, in a group where we're building off of the approaches and the experiences of the shoulders of some giants makes our lives really easy and makes our work really quite exciting. And so um, their, their approach of continuous monitoring of glucose which is really the best in class in the standard today, both in terms of technology as well as application, is quite inspiring for everybody here at Profusa. But you're right. What we've done is build off of that thinking and say, can we detach and separate out the um, sensing component with the detection component? Because if you could do that, you could miniaturize the sensing component in a way and you have much greater latitude to actually work around how do you solve this foreign body response problem uh, only in the sensing element. And then now what's left is the trick of, and then now what's left is the trick of getting the data or getting the signal from that sensing element outside the body, uh, from inside the body to outside of the body and be able to capture and detect it. And we think that technologically, if you disaggregate those two components, it actually is a much easier problem to solve those inherent problems. So to your point, there is three stages for us to translate biochemistry concentration levels into a signal that we actually uh, uh, can translate into a data point. Uh, the first step, step is the sensing itself. And that magic relies on the sensor that I've described earlier. Uh, it's fluorescent space. So basically the sliver of hydrogel that has the porosity on it that we put on the surface of the skin, that it's injected, it, it, it sit there passively. And it ha it, think of that scaffolding as a stage. And on that stage is decorated with a bunch of sensing chemistry. And they're all just kind of sitting there. And the binding and unbinding of the, the thing that you want to measure. So for an oxygen sensor, is the sensing chemistry that binds specifically to oxygen is sitting on a scaffolding and there's a bunch of free oxygen floating around and it'll bind onto that chemistry sometimes and won't bind onto that chemistry sometimes. And that act, that interaction, that, that binding event, it's just constantly happening in the background. And, uh, and that's okay because anytime you actually want to take the data point, because the binding chemistry that we've decorated on the on that scaffolding is fluorescence in nature, uh, and when the oxygen is bound versus the oxygen is un unbound, that fluorescence characteristic changes is different. What we then have is on the surface of the skin a very simple optical reader, and that uh, and that's just a fancy way of saying it's a little device, no bigger than. Uh, let's say a, a watch that people are actually uh, used to wearing. And by the way, um, the path of that technology is pretty straightforward where you could be as small as a thin little Band-Aid that sits on the surface of the skin. And any time you actually want to take a data point, uh, a, a light is emitted from that little device, just a little short pulse of light, uh, very, very similar to... Uh, how Fitbit or Apple Watch or any of the smart watches out there that are taking pulses and taking uh, blood oxygen levels today. Just a little pulse of light going through the skin. And that light will illuminate that sensor under the surface of the skin, illuminate those fluorescence molecules, and excite that fluorescence molecule to emit now another wavelength of light. And that different wavelength, different color that comes back through the skin that same device that we have on the skin will capture it through a photo detector. 
And a photo detector is just a simple or oh, a fancy word for um, something that actually detects light, like a camera, uh, like a camera would. Uh, what traditionally would be film now is just electronic that catches catches light that comes back. And that photo detector in our device, in that photo detector on our device that catches the light that actually comes back, will process that light signal and be able to give you, uh, based on internal calibrations and calibrations in the laboratory. Um, a value, a number that tells you how much oxygen in concentration or how much glucose in concentration is in that interstitial environment where the sensor sits today. And um, because this is done by light, you know, the old joke is uh, it's very difficult to turn off the light before you actually get into the bed uh, uh, while the room is still light. Um, light happens very, very quickly. And so while I'm taking a long time describing this phenomenon, the process of actually how our sensors emit, uh, take a measurement, emit light that allows a photo detector to actually take a measurement, that happens so quickly that you can actually take a measurement uh, two, three times a second without any uh, problems to the system. And so by taking these discrete measurements, but you could take discrete measurements very rapidly, you could actually now piece together a continuous stream of biochemistry data. It's like taking a blood test every second, every five seconds of your lives uh, without actually having to go through the pain of getting a vial of blood drawn, but getting that same richness of information out. Um, that's how our technology it actually clearly works. seems a work of science fiction, and you so casually state it. Do you, do you, does it seem like a science fiction to you, Ben? Yeah, uh, you know it's such a compliment, uh, Lee. When you say that, when other when others actually describe that, you know it doesn't seem like science fiction to us, uh, only because one, it's reality, and two, we understand the science behind this so well. Um, you know, we we've been very fortunate um, over the lifetime of our company to not have not only have gotten great support from like minded investors and individuals who actually an organization we actually have alignment to the mission that we have. But we've also been very fortunate to have gotten support through uh, government organizations such as uh, the NIH and DARPA uh, to have given us a, a funding support, uh, actually to the tune of more than $30 million to date uh, from the government. And these processes obviously are incredibly competitive, especially through the governmental agencies. There are grant applications, they're reviewed by the best and the brightest in the relevant scientific fields. They're competitive. They're scored and, and benchmarked against other applications. Uh, and then we are very fortunate to be able to come out on top. So what seems like science fiction in many ways uh, is actually reality. And it's reality based on technologies that have been vetted through very rigorous and publicly disclosed uh, forums. And so we're, we're quite pleased with that. And I think when we hear, uh, uh, you know, this notion that, wow, it sounds a lot like science fiction, we feel like we've done something then because um, we understand that technology is sound. We have technology that's, that's, that, that is on the market and that's been approved in uh, Europe. So this approach is validated. It's validated through uh, multiple very rigorous approaches. It's validated through multiple very rigorous... It's validated through uh, through multiple. Yeah, is that, is that your calendar? Your calendar, yeah, sorry. Your That's calendar is a, a demanding one. It's been getting quite aggressive. It's blown up. Sorry. I'll give you a second. Sorry, yeah. that no problem. So uh, it's validated through multiple very rigorous pro uh, 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 processes and procedures, and so when we hear the. The uh, description as a science fiction, uh, I, I think it just means that we're creating something really, really transformative and bringing you know high technology to life, and and that's very exciting to us. It definitely seems science fiction to me. I can't even begin to imagine even uh, some of the large uh, blocks you've needed to solve, like calibration. I mean, it it would seem impossible to get something clinical grade calibrated at the at the yeah. level you're talking of. 
Yeah, no. So, so yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. It's such a great question. It's it's clearly something that uh, we work very hard at, right? It, um, and and the challenge of getting a biochemical signal through the uh, skin uh, from inside the body to outside the body um, has been a, a twofold. One, I, we described uh, ad nauseum, which is this whole notion that if you measure inside the body, you have to, you know, you, you elicit this foreign body response and you have to overcome that. And that's something that we've overcome. And then the second is this, to your point, this notion of calibration. And that's mostly driven and rooted by our, our bodies are incredibly complex. And to use a fancy word, the heterogeneity of the tissue is such that it's, it's difficult to find uniformity. And, and also my body is very different than your body. And, and quite frankly, even in, within my body, uh, you know, the tissue and the skin in my forearm is very, than the tissue, very different than the tissue and the skin in my upper arm. And so to be able to calibrate those differences so that those differences do not confound the signal and what we're measuring is a very accurate and specific signal in this incredibly complicated milieu uh, of uh, biochemistry and the environment that we're trying to decode uh, is quite ch uh, challenging. So our approach has actually been twofold. One is we measure, and the way we report the signal that's coming out through light is, a, is, a, um, is fancier than I probably represented. We don't measure the return light relative to its intensity. In other words, uh, if we, 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 we're not looking at the return light from the sensor to see how bright it is or how dim it is, and therefore inferring a concentration. Because if we do that, mm -hmm. then anything that could block that light coming back, being stronger or lighter, could confound that signal. So what we measure is actually uh, what is called a lifetime decay of our specific dye. And that's very specific to our dye. It's not confounded or diminished by any of the other elements in the skin that might uh, contribute that signal. So, so, so we spend a lot of time in the chemistry itself to actually make it so that we can measure the lifetime decay versus uh, the brightness. And then the other way we do it is we just do have different calibration schemes. We, you know, for one analyte, we don't just measure one thing. For one analyte, we measure the contributions of other things around it and subtract or normalize against those other noise. It sounds incredible, Ben. And as far as I understand, each sensor measures one analyte, but you're now trying to take one sensor and stack up multiple chemistries so you can measure multiple biomarkers with one injection, with one sensor. Yeah, so so um, since we're doing this by light... I mean, it seems to make exponentially harder, my misunderstanding here, by putting multiple chemistries on one single sensor. I mean, it, it's, it seems yeah, that I seems actually, to be an order of magnitude more difficult. No, it actually isn't. We, we routinely do two. You know, in, in our parlance, we call that multiplexing, and we routinely do two without any issues, and we believe we could do many, many more. And that's just because, because we're measuring by light and we're getting signal by light. As long as we could get the emitted signal in different wavelengths, uh, we're able to take a picture or, or, or detect via our photo detector multiple data streams simultaneously. It's, a, it's just a difference between taking a black and white picture versus taking a color picture. And so if we could have an oxygen signal that's, that's uh, let, let's say, giving off one uh, wavelength and then a red signal uh, and then a um, glucose signal that's giving off its signal at a, a second wavelength, so on and so forth, our photo detector is able to pick that up. And so it's one, it's one advantage to our approach of using um, optics to get our sensor signal out. And for those of you in the audience and, and Lee, for you who probably know a lot about you know, the automated sequencing and how sequencing is actually being done today. That's exactly uh, their approach, right? They, they do one reaction, but you're able to tease out four different signals from four different bases discreetly all at the same time. Uh, it's been done over and over and over again, and, we're, uh, and, and it will be no different than for us. So the, the ability to do multiple streams on one sliver of hydrogel with one Band-Aid on the surface of your skin is... Um, it's a, it's a this show is album. not about orthodox healthcare, but because this is such a 
well, I go back to calling it a point, a point, a point in science fiction. That I think you're going to turn traditional healthcare upside down in the long term once we have implantable and you have continuous access to uh, body chemistry. Because take today, I don't know how often the average American goes to um, get, say, fasting blood glucose tested or cholesterol or other body chemistries, but I would imagine we're talking years. And your diet alone can drastically change your blood chemistries on a week, if not by day basis. And the choices you make of exercise, not when you sleep, for how long, how long you fast. So there's this absurd disconnection between these episodic, uh, delayed, uh, one-off measurements taken by a clinician every few years and what's going on in your body in response to how you're living your life and the choices that you're making. And so it's hard to see healthcare, orthodox healthcare, surviving that onslaught, which has to take place one day when this is more widespread in, in, in the market. Do you agree? I, I agree 100%. And if, if I may, let me add more color to that. You know, um, uh, our well-being and uh, this notion that we ought to be able to leverage technology to allow us to, allow us to live uh happier and healthier lives is not something new. But unfortunately, most of the technological advancement that's that's occurred over the last, you know, 50 years or so have impacted aspects of our lives and really fundamentally changed them uh, from episodic engagement and, you know, brick and mortar engagement into real time, real time decision making uh, has really impacted only parts of our lives that are outside of our body, but really not within our body. Healthcare is still delivered in a profoundly um, h- historical way. In, yeah, institutional, uh, top down. Yeah. Uh, it's not network. It, exactly right. So, so you get the benefit of the healthcare system only when you go visit a physician. You know, during that face to face interaction, you get the benefit. And, and as you as you know, it's very old, it's also very late in the journey. My last guest, uh, Nathan Price, that's that's what we were talking about. You t- you end up in the healthcare system very late in the journey. Exactly. Uh, you get blood chemistries measured after something is wrong. After you have uh, some- exactly, it's all in the rearview mirror, right? Everything is done in the rearview mirror, and very few things are actually done proactively. And so, what happens is it actually forces you to think about. A population in two very distinct buckets. Either you're a patient when you're under physician's care, or you're a consumer when you're not. And we believe that our technology really could fundamentally change that paradigm because, to your point, uh, listen, if somebody is is developing diabetes, and, and, and let's say I am um, about to become a diabetes uh, patient, and I'm about to suffer from diabetes, the day before I go to see a doctor to get a glucose challenge to get the diagnosis that I'm uh, that I'm di- uh, that I have diabetes, uh, and then the day the day before and the day after, there's nothing magical between those two days. It's not as if I didn't have diabetes the day before my doctor visit, and all of a sudden after that, I'm diagnosed with it. I most likely have been on the path to become a diabetic patient for the last twenty years. It's very different than having a broken bone. Before an event, I'm healthy. And after an event, I had a traumatic event and I actually have a broken bone. For me... Yeah, that's the same for all chronic diseases. Everything. For asthmatic conditions, for heart conditions, for heart condition and glucose. And having an ability in real time to actually measure an individual's biochemistry in a way where it tracks the progression of your well-being from... Uh, something that's completely healthy in a state that's completely healthy to you're marching down to this clinical definition to triggering that clinical definition. Having that knowledge base and having that data will allow an individual, or quite frankly, the healthcare community to be able to engage much earlier to flatten out that curve, if you will, and prevent the triggering of that clinical diagnosis, which triggers a bunch of expensive and bad things coming down the line. And you know, I think the vision that we're talking about, that the ability to, be act, to do that, to have real-time information that allows you to change your behavior or create actions or activities that influences or prevents bad things from happening, I think that vision has been around. It's, it's, it's driven the digital health 
uh, wave. It's driven the telemedicine wave. That vision has been around for a while. But what's not been around and what's not been uh, available to make that vision a reality is how how do you make those decisions? What is the data? What the data set and the, the clinical so what, if you will, that when you see a number coming off of your device and that number is 168, what does that number 168 means? And what would a doctor do about the number of 168? Whatever it is that you're measuring, whether it's 168 steps or 168 mix per deciliter of glucose or 168 micromolars of oxygen, that number has to be meaningful. And it has to be meaningful in a way that links up to a body of knowledge that doctors actually care about so you could get the right advice. And on top of that, it has to be done in a way, that data has to be you know, gathered, if you will, in a way where an individual doesn't mind it being gathered. Another barrier has always been, um, I could get that information, but gosh, it would just, it's a pain to get it, right? Either I have to, uh, I have to manage a technology in a way that I'm not used to, or I have to charge something and put it on my body, or I have to actually do something special and wear something special on me. And because it's intrusive to somebody's lives, most of us would not have the compliance or, or, or the, the reason to actually do it for any extended period of time. And then the third barrier is the technology actually has to be accessible and accessible in a way that's not just that's available on the shelf, but accessible in that economically, it's not a huge investment, if you will, for an individual to actually have access to technology. So a continuous glucose monitor that could benefit a bunch of people, but it costs $4,000 a year, will likely not get the kind of adoption as if a technology that's widely available but only costs $80 or it costs nothing, uh, but every month costs you the same as the price of a Netflix subscription and it's something that a lot of people could actually afford and have access to. And unless you could hit all three, that you gather data in real time that a doctor actually could care about or a clinical community care about. So you could get real knowledge and real uh, meaningful uh, so what's out of them and do so in a way where you're not putting undue imposition into a person's life to adopt it so that adoption is not an issue. The person could just live their lives without having to babysit some device and then do so in a way where economically, it's not going to break somebody's bank that anybody could actually afford it. If you could hit all three of those, then I think you could actually bring this vision of changing the way healthcare is thought about, empowering individuals to be able to make healthcare decisions and decisions about their well-being and do so in a really meaningful way that changes how insurance companies, healthcare providers and such think about keeping a population or individual healthy. And so far, the technology landscape has not been able to come up with something that hits all three of those categories. And we are Profusa, um, uh, really, I think, are really proud of being, be, being able to lead that way because our technology really hits all three of those categories uh, quite nicely. Well, I'm honored to, to have you, Ben. Ben, I'm not sure if you're aware of my story, and because I mentioned or alluded to it on on a on a few shows now, I I won't cover it. But what I will say is, I was lucky enough, I accidentally get cheap access to my blood chemistry, and uh, no physician in between, and that changed my life for the better. And it's a good part of why we're we're talking today. Because once the barrier was gone of having to see a physician, of having episodic measurement and being able to tweak my diet, tweak my lifestyle and get the data back relatively quickly, I mean, relative to, 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 uh, to present day, I've been able to vastly uh, improve my blood chemistry, improve my sense of well-being. So obviously I'm excited when you're talking about an injectable sensor that can do continuous tracking of blood chemistry. Because I hope that in the long run, what you're going to do is you're going to remove the barrier between people and their own blood chemistry. And you're going to reduce, well, in terms of reducing barrier, I hope, one, you reduce the cost. And two, eventually, I hope we don't need uh, medical practitioners as uh, in between us and our own body data. Yeah, exactly, Lee. And 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 I, and I would probably add to that last statement uh, where I, uh, 
Listen, it's my firm belief that the medical practitioners will always be a partner in, in this journey. I think what we want to be able to do is not to remove the medical practitioner as a as an intermediary, but rather create a platform where where that knowledge base and where the 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 practitioner playing the intermediary and the outcome of that, the insights from that, the decisions from that intermediate from that medical practitioner actually accrues benefit to an individual without that inv- individual going to a doctor or doing anything out other than just living his or her life. Uh, you know, right now for me to get that benefit and for you to get that benefit, you got to get in the car and drive somewhere. I want that benefit. I think that the, I think these wonderful physicians who are doing the clinical research, who are actually taking care of patients and creating that insight is something that is going to be really difficult to replace. As a matter of fact, I want to, to make them even more product, productive and better. And, uh, but I want to get their knowledge base in my pocket. I want to get their advice uh, in my year, anytime, anywhere that I actually want. And I think we do that through technologies like this. We do that through technologies like this, where the advice that comes through your phone is driven by data, but also backed by an algorithm or backed by insights from a physician community that uh, that delivers that insight to you without you having to actually uh, call a doctor every time you actually want that insight. And I think if you do that, if you actually do that, you take away the risk of deploying deploying a technology like this, and when you uh, uh, and and yet you actually could increase the benefit of those interactions across time across geography and across the evolution, uh, if you will, of disease states or disease progression within an individual, uh, then I think you actually have something. Then I think the epidemics that we actually uh, are experiencing and the high cost and the high cost burden of keeping a population healthy can actually be driven down dramatically because you become much more efficient at using your most expensive resources and you're actually much more efficient at deploying your most knowledgeable resources across a broader base of individual. I I'm I hear what you're saying, but I think that the healthcare we have today is more incentivized towards a treatment model, i.e. procedures, pills, and uh, acute care. Uh, and I I'm, I don't know if you've heard previous episodes. But the gist of this podcast is my belief, a strongly founded belief, after many years of research and conversations, that a secondary healthcare is emerging, which I, I might call healthcare for healthy people or hyper well being, or I, I may say wellness as a, a service. And I think you're going to have a separate healthcare and it's focused on prediction, prevention, and optimization because healthcare today doesn't does not do optimization of blood chemistry, okay, and it does a very poor job of prevention of chronic disease, and it it, it does near nil uh, prediction, and prediction, prevention, and optimization I see as a data science problem, not uh, the healthcare of the 20th century type problems. I think you're going to have a secondary healthcare that's founded upon data science. And Brad Perkins, who was my first guest, he, I was more along the lines of the machine knows best, more swinging towards the data feeding into algorithms and less people. But Brad has pushed me towards a sort of intermediate angle because he's very strong on what we actually need is a new breed of clinicians who are actually data scientists. This is a long-term view, Lee. I, I actually I cannot agree with you more. And 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 if I if I was in, inarticulate in my last set of comments, uh, let me try to reorient it a little bit. I I, I I agree. I absolutely think that the healthcare paradigm, or at least the economics of the healthcare paradigm, is going to actually change, and it has to. It has to because as we live longer. Uh, Chronic conditions, by definition, is just going to grow, and by and uh, and also because the latter stages of chronic disease management are usually the more expensive stages, and as we live longer, the cost burden on the system is just going to go up and up. If you're just treating the disease and condition, and so it's not sustainable, and we see that today already, both in terms of reimbursement philosophies here or there, or innovative programs from insurance companies or other payers to trying to invest in areas. In arenas where prevention becomes more important rather than treatment, 
what's happening though is there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg, right? The, the, the reason that the healthcare system is set up this way is because modalities of prevention has never been effective or robust enough to be able to move the needle to say, yeah, not only can you, can you create the prevention and invest in it to create good outcomes, but a lot of people are actually going to do it. And we've never been successful because I think technology, whether it's technology or culture, it's just not been there. And so a lot, a lot of, if not most of the clinical research budget, uh, most of the knowledge base generation in the clinical community and medical community really is about, okay, finding the symptoms and then going and treating those symptoms and then trying to get somebody better. And that just, that, that, and that, and that sort of embeds into the economics of reimbursement, right? But I think as you, as as folks like you, folks like uh, like my colleagues at Profusa and others, start to leverage and think about what's the what are the powers that we could bring to bear from technology perspective, as well as proving out that prevention is beneficial by leveraging this technology. I think actually you will create this following, because prevention is always going to be cheaper, and if you could create a solution that that gets better outcomes at a lower price via prevention or via technology, then you're going to force the payers of the world, whether it's a government, whether it's a public health agency, whether it's an individual, families, or insurance company or capitated systems, you're going to force the payers to actually look for more innovative solutions because economically it actually works out better for the same, if not better, outcome of the populations that they actually serve. And I, I completely agree with you. That's what's going to happen. And when that wave occurs, and when that wave occurs, and I think we're beginnings of that today, then you will have medical practitioners really rethinking and revamping the way that they practice as well as the way that they're trained. You know, we see that in, in certain specialties today, right? Um, the patient population is in the vascular space, and so a lot of interventional cardiologists or interventional radiologists start going into vascular surgeon space, because that's where the patient population is. Doctors will change their behavior, change their practice based on where the market, if you will, takes them or where the patient needs actually take them. That'll happen organically. And so I think it's a very exciting time to be in this space because you're right, physicians will follow. And all I'm saying is the danger of that migration, if you will, is that you leave the intellectual insight behind that you leave decades of experience or a physician knowledge base or some, phys or some medical education behind by trying to do too much with the artificial intelligence and machine learning and what the data actually tells you. And, um, and I think your guess is spot on. Um, the way to hit that balance is leverage each party for what they're good at. What data science is really good at is look at patterns in large numbers much more efficiently than humans can. What people are really good at is actually drawing the connections and creating the creative so what's, if you will, off of the data set and be able to guide the decisions and choices uh, not within the norm, but actually outside of the norm. And so if you are able to have physicians give you the input into the algorithm and let the machines do what they're really good at is crunch large number of data sets with that input, I think you actually have a winning formula. And so, uh, you know, I never want to cut the physicians out. It's just using them in a very different way and leveraging their knowledge base to to patient populations or individuals who normally would not be under their care. I hear you and I, I understand, and I understand that's the approach to take in what I'll call it the near term. Some people may call it the medium term. Part of my issue is I know quite a few physicians, I family, yeah. and they actually know very little about nutrition. And most chronic disease a primary driver, if not the primary driver, is actually our nutritional intake, for example. And as you pointed out, these are not sudden; these are not uh, injuries you're getting, or a virus, or a bacteria. Instead, these diseases are taking 10, 20, 30, 40 years to build. And so, I, I just don't feel regular physicians are in in 
are, are going to work in the domain of prediction, prevention, and optimization. Some will go along for the ride, as Brad Perkins pointed out. And I do think there, there will be some overlap, i.e. Some, some sort of way in which orthodox healthcare will try and intervene earlier. So I do think you'll have all that e-monitoring, et cetera, take place. I think that will happen. But I think the real excitement is once you start uh, measuring people's biology continuously, soaking it into the cloud, running algorithms on it, uh, maybe running avatars of people's biology in between blood drawers and trying to precision guide people's life and environment. Most of most disease today is caused by environment, our environment. Uh, that's including diet. So I think what we're needing is uh, machines, software, to tell us, hey, how to modify the environment, uh, particularly for our biology. You know, I'm a big fan of ancestral medicine, but I also understand that the, we have our own unique uh, say genetics and epigenetics that could be better matched to our environment. So what, it would be nice if machines guided us towards uh, what is optimal for us. For example, what time to go to bed, what blue light to get, what red light to get, etc. So I, I just do see that machine-driven world coming together for optimization, prediction, and prevention. And I hope I don't take you too far off, but I would like to uh, pull pull back and. You had mentioned diabetes, and I know that your wife had gestational diabetes. And could you could you tell me about that episode with, with, that you once mentioned with salad dressing, Ben? Yeah, so so um, uh, you know, I'm, my wife and I were very very fortunate to have three wonderful children. And when she was pregnant with our uh, youngest daughter, who's uh, four years old now, Gracie. Uh, she was diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And so um, she was incredibly compliant, by the way. She was a great patient. Uh, she would check her blood sugar religiously, uh, try to keep her blood sugar in line so that Gracie could grow up to be a healthy uh, individual, which, which she, she is. And um, through that process, she actually learned a lot about herself. And one of the things she, she actually learned was her diet um, – Listen, when you're when you suffer from diabetes, or when you're around somebody who actually is suffering from diabetes, uh, it, there are certain things that are obvious, right? Do not eat that sugary donut, right? Don't drink that Coke. Um, what's What's funny is there are certain things that are not so obvious. So, is that salad okay? Well, it turns out that that salad is okay depending on the salad dressing, and um, you know, is that sushi okay? Well, it turns out that sushi is okay depending on what fish and what you actually put with that fish. And so she had experience where she thought she was doing great by trying to control her glycemic level by going on a salad diet. And it turns out that that Thai salad dressing was just loaded with sugar. Now, it tasted tart. And so she didn't think it was sugar laden. And then her blood sugar went through the roof when she actually came home and learned something about it. And I think you know, lead to the topic of remote monitoring, what we, to the topic of real time biochemistry and the insight that it actually could provide for you. Um, that's exactly it. That's one of the great use cases, which is it educates an individual on what, what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. And there are landmines around us all the time. Uh, there are landmines around us all the time where we may not be making the optimal choices. Uh, even though we may think we are, and I think measuring your blood chemistry, measuring your blood chemistry, measuring measuring your blood chemistry in real time to be able to give you that body information, is what I was referring to when I say this information could actually allow you to make real time decisions and change your behavior and actions that could align your choices to the better health outcome. The the a, a few more questions here, Ben. I don't want to overshoot the time we have, but I do have a, a few more questions. This injector, it's a unique injection kit. So at the moment, it's a, it is what I would term a medical procedure. Do you think that will ever get reduced to something someone could do at home? Do you think that could ever become a possibility? Yes. It's not just a possibility, but it's definitely central to our product development plans. Uh, there, there are a variety of precedents already out there on, on a self-deployment inside the home. And um, yeah. So you, somebody could definitely 
uh, do that. And I have, oh, that's fantastic, Ben. I had no idea because the injector looked quite complicated from the image I saw of it. And in terms of cost, I have no idea of cost. I don't need costs specifically from you. But do you, is this is this going to trend towards being affordable by the consumer? Like, say, Libra patches are, in fact, I would argue that Libra patches are not affordable or the Dexcom ones. So I don't know where they fit in on, on a price point, but I'd like to know if you if that price point will get quote cheap. Yeah, so um, so the good news, right, is, um, as I mentioned before, the accessibility is a issue that we actually think about and talk about quite a bit. You know, our ambition is that our technology ought to be able to touch a billion people around the world. And that, and to be able to achieve that type of scale, you need to be able to have an economic model, at least a, a model of your technology where accessibility is important, it is, can be readily achieved, and price point cannot be a barrier or shouldn't be a barrier. And so I won't share any of the specifics uh, with your audience, but let's just say that, um, you know, from a Western uh, viewpoint, let's say in the U.S., um, if you're in the U.S. market or European market uh, or you're living in the U.S. or living in Europe, I would say um, adopting a technology like ours would not create any more burden than your ability to enjoy your Netflix or Spotify subscription. <laughs> that fits very well into a wellness as a service price point for the average consumer. Exactly. Or it won't cost you any more than, let's say, going out and buying a pair of running shoes, which you probably would do. You, you know, you probably should do anyways if you're going to go exercise. Or it probably wouldn't cost more than a, uh, than a very nice meal for two, you know, at a restaurant. You know, it, it will be, it, you know, Lee, it, it will be at a, at a point where price will not be a barrier for anybody who wants to adopt it. It sounds amazing. And um, when you say one billion people, it actually sounds achievable, Ben, which sounds ludicrous to say sounds achievable, that, that volume. Yeah, we, we think so, too. It's obviously a, 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 an ambitious goal, but I think, uh, you know, we wake up in the morning. All my colleagues and I uh, wake up every morning and go to work with an incredible degree of enthusiasm because we think, we believe that fundamentally our technology really, fundamentally our technology really can transform the way healthcare is actually delivered. There's no, I think there's no, bigger problem that face us today. And I think there's no better opportunity to face us today that, that we leave behind a world where our children could grow up to be healthier and happier for a lot longer. I don't think we should should ever give up on the hope and the aspiration to bring health and well-being to not just the people who could, who could afford it, but the people who are less fortunate than we are. But this is this is very concrete, though, what, what, what you're doing. Because at the moment, you know, since 2008, we've been able to measure, say, heart rate or respiration. But we haven't had access to our own body data, our own blood chemistry. And our yeah. food choices massively impact our blood chemistry quite quickly and Absolutely. other lifestyle choices. And we haven't had access to that, Ben. Absolutely. And then when you think about it, culturally speaking, right, we all eat different types of foods and have different uh, bent, if you will, depending on where you live. And unfortunately, uh, food choices and lifestyle choices are also very much driven by the socioeconomic uh, status of an individual, wherever you actually are. And so having a, 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 a accessible, accurate, a deployable way of monitoring individuals' health, either through food intake or environment, and measuring the outcome of that via biochemistry, uh, I think can fundamentally change the way global health is actually viewed, not just in places like the U.S., but places like Sub-Saharan Africa, places like more rural India and rural China, where traditionally this kind of information is actually not available. And so... Um, you know, that type of mission is actually, that, that aspect of the mission is incredibly important to us. Uh, creating technology that empowers the individual to make healthcare decisions locally. Um, and it's why we work really, really hard to make sure that while there may be other barriers 
logistically, mechanically, other barriers that prevents these technologies to be deployed, that cost should not be one of them. And we're fortunate that our technology is inherently uh, amenable to that uh, value engineering, if you will, taking costs out. To crack that one billion market, you're going to need to get the data to the mobile phone, to the smartphone with yes. minimum friction. Yes. I'll presume that's an, uh, yeah, more. No, You've yeah, kind of so realized that one, and that's, exactly. that's to be underway. It, it not only is it underway, it is how the data is actually transmitted. So right now the data is going from a sensor via light to the read on the surface of the skin and then via Bluetooth to the phone. And oh, then so it's that, Bluetooth, okay. Yeah. And then at that point you could actually, you know, figure out whether and control as an individual, do you want that data to then go to the cloud for other purposes or do you want to just keep it local? You know, we 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 um as a company went down that path because to your point, Leah, it's very insightful that you have to leverage the phone. Um, and if you if you look at the phone industry, the telecommunication industry, the, the, there's a really interesting phenomenon that has occurred, which is the deployment of landlines, while that's the progression, right, of centralized operators to landlines so that you have phones inside the house to cellular communication in the car to cellular communications in the pocket. That migration, that progression, if you will, in the U.S. and Western world, uh, did not occur in uh, rural India, rural China, sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Africa. They've kind of just leapfrogged over the landline phase, and everybody has a phone in their pocket now. And so with the wide deployment of phone, the ease of, ease of, ease of access to the phone and the cellular network and the phones in, uh, in, in individuals' pockets, uh, we felt that it was really important for our data to be transmitted that way. Yeah, and the phone, uh, you know, phone. The, the smartphone is struggling on the front of innovation, and that's why they're getting similar and, you know, they're getting less exciting. And I do see that health is the next wave of the mobile phone, the mobile phone being a health and wellness companion and a clinically validated, in many cases, uh, health companion. So in terms of measuring that interstitial fluid, what we want to get a handle on is the likes of measuring our stress, our metabolism, diet, dehydration, etc. So I presume you, you, you're looking at achieving those insights. Yeah, so, so Lee, exactly, right? So, you know, um, you touched upon it earlier regarding the, the environment and the technology that we have available to us. And, you know, our approach at Profusa is... Um, the, the philosophical approach is obviously we want to create a platform to to uh, unlock the stream of biochemistry data that res, reside inside every one of us. Uh, but the higher level approach really is that data ought to augment uh, the other streams of information that's all around us to help us make much better choices. That what we're measuring is a biochemical endpoint. But that biochemical endpoint ought to be married to other data and other information that provides context to that to that uh, to what's happening inside the body. So, pollen count, geolocation, altitude, activity level, your voice, how you're feeling, proxy by your voice. Absolutely, I agree. And feelings or emotions extremely important. That's right. So if you stitch all of that together, then you could actually marry. Okay, when you're when you're physical behavior uh, or a level of activities in this way, and that happens in this external environment at this time and point of the day that, that occurs after when you didn't have a good night of sleep, which creates some stress as, as um, uh, depicted or picked up by your voice, uh, just the, the voice as well as uh, word choice patterns mm -hmm. that links to an end-stage biochemistry that has this biochemical outcome that links to a hey, that biochemistry signature therefore means that your you know uh, physical health is actually declining a little bit. You're not in a healthy zone, if you will. That holistic picture makes the body's data much more powerful because then it becomes actionable. You could either you know get more sleep, prevent being being in the presence of that environment. Uh, get get rid of or change your context, or at least warn you. Hey, if you're in that context because you know that's always going to happen, then you know what to do about it. Uh, that becomes much more powerful. And so for us, 
we we look at our data stream as just as a critical piece of that puzzle, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. That we well, it's can a huge, huge, Ben, it's a hugely important piece, blood chemistry, because I, I could talk about it a longer and, and I'm very wary of time, though. But blood chemistry has been underutilized. And that's what I was talking to uh, about with my last guest. A blood chemist, uh, there's a lot of excitement around genetic testing or microbiome testing, et cetera. But regular cheap blood chemistry is, is largely untapped. And the last speaker was talking about applying AI to standard cheap blood chemistry and achieving amazing results for people. And when you start speaking about that holistic data picture, which I love and wholly agree with and it's it's tremendously exciting when you can capture a person's movement gestures intonation feeling mind state and stitch it all together but then there's a next stage where you could feed into ai systems to do multivariate analysis and yes you yeah you end up with machines working out the causes of human disease and the causes of human depression and you actually end up with machines knowing humans better than humans know humans you know the the um, uh, listen. We we're as I mentioned earlier, we're building off the of shoulders of giants here, and I think this entire healthcare industry is an exciting, exciting place. And you know, we look at the importance of the genomics data. We look at the importance of the microbiome data because they are important. But I kind of put them in the category of you know, genomics and microbiome information are like atlases. You know, the the old. I'm old enough to remember yeah. that when I. Drive, yeah, I, I agree with you there. Get a book of Rand McNally Atlas every single year. And uh, and the real-time continuous biochemistry data is like Waze or Google Maps, where yes. it actually creates new real-time information, allows you to actually make changes in your choices to try to circumvent an accident. That's a good analogy, Ben, and it's one I, I strongly agree with also. In terms of blood chemistry, so you can measure like urea, uh, creatine and what about hormones like cortisol because a lot of people have say cortisol dysregulation and it's it's kind of timely and expensive to work out when people have such circadian rhythm disruption i.e it's it's affecting cortisol i.e they're not making it in the morning and they're making it in the afternoon or they're making some at night when they shouldn't be making any uh, listen everything that you actually mentioned uh, are possible uh, as long as they is, they are available in the interstitial fluid, like hormone cortisol, actually would be, um, they would be very important markers uh, to actually uh, measure. You, you know, here's here's the potential power of this platform that people have not looked at, and it it talks a little bit about what, and it touches on how you actually were talking about uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, what machines can actually tell you. It is possible and quite frankly likely that cortisol concentration is going up and down or any hormone concentration going up and down and biomarkers going up and down are not uh, – it, it's, it's likely that they're not uh, singu singular events. In other words, they're not moving up and down in isolation, that their other biomarkers are likely will, will trace or move up and down in the body as a response to or as a precursor to. The, the hormones and other biomarkers going up and down. Then in other words, that their movements are linked, that you actually get this. It's a dance, if you will, that you know uh, biomarker A and B always move a certain way before you sp see a spike in biomarker C. And so it, it, it's, the likely scenario is as we develop more and more flavors of our biochemistry sensors, and as we get more and more information in, that we'll be able to predict and be able to monitor, you know, many more biochemical markers than the ones that we actually have to measure, that we could actually infer with high degree of accuracy what all other markers are are likely to occur. I agree. Uh, mm -hmm. What we have already, and so we may not have to measure cortisol to be able to get the benefit of knowing how cortisol is moving in the body. Yes, I don't know if you saw bloodcalculator.com. Uh, I have not. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes and I'll send you a link. I think you'll be, be quite interested in what they're doing. In the, in the final few questions I have for you here, when is glucose going to be on the market? Because that's obviously, I, I, I think that's what most, con that's number one on a, on a consumer list is glucose. 
Yeah. So, you know, uh, as you know, Lee, in, in, in our industry here, being on the market is really driven by when we can regu- get regulatory approval. So what we could control is when we actually submit and apply. What we cannot control is when the European regulatory bodies or what FDA is going to say yes and okay. We're optimistic because there's clear path uh, of approval here. Uh, but but it's it's just difficult for me to actually tell when the approval is going to happen because we can't control what questions they're going to ask and what they're going to do. But I can say that we are in human studies and human trials right now, and they're going really, really well. Um, and um, we are optimistic that, you know, over the next 12 to 18 months, we'll be able to submit. Oh, and is that submission in Europe and the U.S.? Is that CE or FDA? Or um, what about Asia? Yeah, it- yeah, it's both. So most likely, you know, the 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 current way, if you will, a current strategy for most med tech companies is to seek European approval first, and then seek U.S. approval second. Now, it um, y- you know this as well as I do. You know this as well as I do. You know the submission process is really not like running a race, you know, where everybody lines up on the starting line and then there's a gun and then boom, you, you start a submission. Uh, we are constantly engaging with the FDA and the CE regulatory bodies even now to talk about our platform, to talk about our strategy, to talk about, you know, what concerns that they actually may have so that as we develop our sensors and as we actually go in and get the clinical evidence required for the submission, we're doing so not in a vacuum, but with the guidance of the reg- regulatory body. So one could argue that so sort of the submission process, if you will, right, the the engagement and the conversation is already ongoing. So um, we we are engaged with regulatory bodies all over the world for those purposes. Should I be watching out in 2019? You know, uh, I appreciate you keeping an eye on us. I hope you're more than just uh, watching out for us. I hope you're rooting for us as well because uh, – uh, you know, we're going to make a big difference in the world. And yeah, watch out in 20, 2019. Watch out in 2019. Well, I do believe, in fact, I'll say I know, I'll go this far, the, the majority of humans in developed countries will have implantable biosensors for continuous long-term monitoring of blood chemistries. Yeah, that, that's not an opinion. Yeah. That, that's just a given. And we can debate the privacy, we can debate the ethics, we can debate how it will be used, but I think it, it's, it, it has to happen. I, I agree. I agree. I think, and I think that demand is going to be there, whether it's through the individuals or through the payers or through some healthcare programs. I think the demand is going to be there. It, it, it just makes too much sense for it. Not, it does. It's back much. to that whole car analogy a lot of people give, saying, hey, a car has 200 sensors uh, operating continuously, but we don't have our own for the human body. That's exactly right. I think you're creating the future, the far out future. And I think it's a more positive future, Ben. And I think you're you're aware of that. I can hear that in this conversation. So I've greatly appreciated your time today. And I'm going to wish you the best of luck with uh, the approvals and that you need to go through with the company. Well, thank you very much, Lee. It's, it's, uh, it's always a lot of fun for me to talk to uh to you and to uh, folks like you. So um, thank you for the opportunity for me to share what our company is doing. And um, hopefully this has been productive and useful for you and your audience. It body. certainly has been. And I really appreciate the update, Ben. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for thinking of us. Thanks for thinking of us, Lee. Thanks. For more information, please see hyperwellbeing.com or follow Twitter at hyperwellbeing.com.